I am so happy you're all here. This is, uh, this is ex ex exciting. As you know, this institute is based on subjects that matter with people who make a difference. And today, we have our ambassador who certainly has and is continuing to make a difference in our world. And I, I feel very blessed that you came. Thank you. And I hope all of you people who have never been here will all become members because that's how we get our audience and this is how we can afford to do it. John Ricolta was our ambassador to the United Arab Immigrants from 2019 to 2021. He, before he did that, he was chairman of the board of one of the largest uh, engineering building um, plant, uh, automobile plants all, all over America and the world. It, he gave that up to become our ambassador and we have been really blessed because he was one of the people who got involved in the Abraham Accord, which was a major deal and hopefully we can keep it, but we'll find it. Anyway, he's a resident of Palm Beach, Florida, so we can all see him again. And Terry, his wife, and John have, were smart enough to see that you can use soft power. And that's the cultural exchange, and they're going to talk about that, as well as hard power, which is our country. Thank you. So as we get started here, uh, soft power is a big thing and uh, my wife published a book about our experience and I'm going to pass it around to your tables here so that you can take a look at it while we're going through this presentation. Unfortunately, I only have four left and um, uh, there's more than four tables. Let me take one over to the other table. Okay. Here we go. You can start. I have one more. I have a couple other goodies you can look at if you're interested while we're going through this. Okay, I'm sorry. Once you're done with it, maybe you could pass it over to the other table. Um, you'll get yours in a minute. So I titled this speech, The Road to Abraham, but before I actually get started, I want to recognize my wife. She played an incredible role in the success that our country had I tell a little story about getting prepared. She went to every designer in the United States of America, every store, and bought a wardrobe that you could not believe. <laughs> and we got out there with 22 trunks of clothing, and she never opened one of them. She wore an abaya the entire two years that we were there. And this was her decision. She wasn't forced on her. Most of the people in society don't wear abayas. And um, it really made a big impact on all of the Emiratis knowing that she tried to adapt to their culture. And this was sort of our theme as we went through and you see how it sort of developed. So I always like to start out by talking a little bit about the UAE and for some reason this is not working. Let's turn it on. Okay. Yes, I see that, but we want to get past that. Huh. No, they just had brand new batteries put in it. Huh. It worked earlier. Maybe I have to stand over here. Oh, you know, it's a pointer, and that's not what we want. <clears throat> Okay, let's try it again. <clears throat> there we go. There we go. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to have to have honey or Linda. Could you sit right here? Let me move your chair over just a bit. And I, yes, we're gonna, I'm going to do my first one myself so we're not here all afternoon. 
So the UAE is in a very dangerous part of the world. I didn't realize when I was asked to be the ambassador just how dangerous. And this uh, aerial bird's eye view of the UAE, you can see Abu Dhabi over there. That's where the capital is. Most people think that Dubai is the capital of the UAE. It's not. It's Abu Dhabi. And it's surrounded by enemies. You have Iran uh, to the east. You have the Iraq and uh, Syria problems to the north. You have the civil war going on in Yemen. There were drones, cruise missiles, attacks by the Houthis and the Iranians on the southern border of Saudi Arabia. And then you have this little Abu Dhabi, Dubai, UAE uh, federation right next door. Next slide. No, this one. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is, this is what Abu Dhabi looked like in 1950. Prior to 1971, Abu Dhabi and, and there wasn't a United Arab Emirates. They were called the Trucial States. They were the uh, protected of the British Empire for over 250 years. And in 1969, the British said, we're sorry, we can't afford to protect you anymore. You guys are going to have to come up with something different. And so next slide. This is what Abu Dhabi looks like in 2019 when I got there. It is an amazing transformation. And this transformation that took place has a lot to do with the change of their culture and how this is the one Arab country who has embraced modernity, which is a very, very interesting concept of theirs because it goes against almost everything that Islam has put forth. If you recall, Islam's had one prophet, Muhammad, and his word is sacrosanct, and it cannot be interpreted. Unlike Christianity and Judaism, where they're constantly reinterpreting to keep pace with the advances in modern society, Islam has not. So, next slide, please. The values of this country are really quite remarkable. When we got there, they embraced the year of tolerance and these were the values that supported this year of tolerance collaboration humility respect integrity and excellence and when we got there there were already two jewish enclaves the synagogues were in rented buildings they hadn't started construction yet there was two rabbis one in abu dhabi one in dubai they didn't get along but that's beside the point next slide please Okay, uh, and to show their, their, their march toward this modernity, this is what they call the Abrahamic family house. These are t three very large edifices that are now complete, uh, and it's a Jewish synagogue, it is a Muslim mosque, and it is a, a church, a Christian church. It's built over a large podium, and the intent of this is for these three religions to come together because Abraham was the father of all three religions. And what the Emiratis could never understand was, we all believe in the same thing, we all believe in the same God, we all believe in the Ten Commandments, why are we fighting the way we are? And they embarked on a program in order to change that and to try to change the entire Middle East. Next slide, please. Some of the cultural things they have, you hear about, they spent three and a half billion dollars building the Louvre, Abu Dhabi, it's open, it's got amazing uh, artifacts and history in it. Next slide. Under construction right now is the Zayed National Museum to celebrate Middle Eastern history, all the way back to Muhammad. Next slide. And then there is the Guggenheim, which just broke ground last year. Designed by Frank Gehry, uh, it is twice the size of the um, of the Louvre and all three of these museums and the Abrahamic House, all four of these cultural institutions are all in the same district. They're within walking distance of each other and they have created this cultural district to be able to celebrate culture and what we now define as soft power. Next slide, please. I wanted to end with this. They have a lot of museums. This happens to be a car and truck museum. This is not a photo shop. This is me standing under this full-size replica of a Jeep. And this Jeep actually works. 
And every time we had guests come to the country, I always made sure they went to see, because nobody, they said, oh, you just sort of photoshopped you in here. I didn't, and there are, I don't have enough time to go through all the slides. There's an amazing auto museum that they have there. And so maybe what you and I can do, I'll just go like this and, you know, rather than saying next slide, please. Okay, becoming ambassador. This is both a curse and a benefit and a blessing. Uh, the curse is it takes forever. And uh, the beginning for me was on the 12th of July, 2016. I had been Mitt Romney's national finance chair on two occasions, 2008, 2012. I've been involved with presidential politics since um, Reagan ran. And um, when, uh, when the Trump organization called me in May, of 2016 they asked me if I would serve as the chairperson for the Michigan part of the campaign, I declined. I did not know Donald Trump. I had only seen him through what they call the celebrity apprentice, and I just didn't feel that he could win. Uh, and I had other issues. Those issues were not personality issues. They were issues as it pertained to my business. I build auto plants as I was introduced, the largest auto plant builder in the world. And Donald Trump was giving Ford Motor Company and, and uh, General Motors a very hard time about all the plants that they were building in Mexico. We were building all those plants. And I couldn't rationalize how I could serve him and serve Bill Ford and Mary Barra at the same time, so I declined. And I went home, and I told my lovely wife what happened. She paused and looked at me, and she said, I can't believe you've turned down the opportunity of a lifetime. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you know, all these guys you've supported in the past, McCain and Romney, just to mention two, they lost. Rubio, I was on Rubio's team, and she said, this guy's going to win. And I said, he's not going to win. She said, yes, he is. He's going to win because he has the ear of the blue-collar worker. And my niece, her name is Ronna McDaniel, Terry's niece, actually, from her sister. And uh, she kept on telling us about how these rallies in Michigan were just phenomenal. They'd plan on 3,000 people. 30,000 people would show up. So you knew that you struck something. And so I reconsidered. Uh, I had a little bit of urging, and I went back to the campaign, and I said, I will serve, but I need to meet him first. We need to have a discussion. And so this date, you can see him sitting there with me, we had our discussion. We had a one-hour, one-on-one meeting. And I told him what I've just told you. And he looked at me, and he said, well, tell me how I fix it. How do I get these blue-collar jobs from Mexico back into the United States because at the present rate, we're going to destroy the middle class. And so I told him, and these are the four things that I offered to him. One, get rid of NAFTA. We won't go in today why that's important, but that was a national free trade agreement, which has now been turned into a new agreement. Two, I said the regulations in the United States, air quality permits, time to get a building permit, the NIMBY phenomena, not in my backyard. Nobody wanted to build in the United States. It took too long. Three, said the blue-collar worker in Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania is going to win, going to win you the election because these people are for you and you've got to campaign to them. And finally, he looks at me and he says, I love your way of thinking, but I have a more important question I need to ask you. Now, don't forget this is July 12th. He asked me, he said, who should I pick for vice president? And I said, my gosh, I've never been asked that question before. And he said, well, weren't you with Romney? And I said, yeah, but he, he never asked me ever for my uh, uh, opinion. He said, well, I am. Well, who do you think? I gave him three things. One, your pick shall do you no harm. What does that mean? That if you just know the Thomas Eagleton story, uh, you can figure out uh, where that all went because it cost the Democratic candidate for 1972 the election for picking Thomas Eagleton at his VP. Number two, I said, you need to pick a Republican. Not a rhino, but a real Republican, someone that will bring every single Republican vote, because if you're going to win, you can't afford to lose a single vote. 
Number three, I said, and this is the hardest one at all, in your darkest hour when it seems you're going to lose, this person has to stay by your side. He thought about that for a minute, and he said, you just told me who to pick. And I said to him, who? And he said, can you keep a secret? And I said, sir, I certainly can. And he said, uh, you, you've told me to pick Mike Pence. And I said, well, I won't tell a soul. And 12 days later, he announced Mike Pence as his pick. Next slide. So what's it look like to go on this pathway? So all that work I did set me up to be picked, not as the ambassador for the UAE, but the ambassador to Romania. And I was only too happy to go. My wife wasn't. But, you know, we don't have a choice. And you don't have a choice we're going to get picked to go. So I started going through these steps right here. There's 14 major steps. Each step is just filled with intrigue. It's filled with problems. It's filled with success. And it's filled with digging into your past in a way that you would have never, never expected. Because what they're trying to figure out is can you be trusted with the secrets of the United States of America. That is their one goal. They don't really care that much about your competence. They care about whether you can be trusted and whether people can blackmail you or if there's something there that can cause you to divulge these secrets. And I want to tell you, you get to know a lot of secrets when you become an ambassador. I got stuck in two places. The first one is the yellow. All that paperwork that I did to go to Romania didn't count when it was time for me to go to the UAE. And you might ask, well, how did that all happen? And that is because in the summer of 2017, as I was going through all of this, Donald Trump wasn't happy with all of the selections that he had made that were going forward for Senate confirmation. So he asked Steve Mnuchin to take a review on anybody who hadn't been confirmed, and I hadn't, to take a review and to see if that was an appropriate person to go. When they got to my name, Steve Mnuchin, who knew me, said to the president, we need to send this guy to a place where he can do us some good. He has some talent. And so they took me off the table for the UAE and called me up, said, come to the White House. We have good news and bad news. I said, okay. I went, what's the bad news? The mad, bad news is you're not going to Romania. I said, okay. What's the good news? We would like you to go to a moderate Arab country. What would be the next question? Which one? We can't tell you. Why? Because even though the National Security Council is not involved in the picking of ambassadors, we know this is going to be a problem with the State Department because the State Department wants a career officer to go there. And the career officer had gone for 50 years. I was going to be the first political appointee, and they knew they were going to be in for a real fight, and they wanted to have the National Security Council on their side. So it took another 60 days for the National Security Council to weigh in. At the time, it was John Bolton. They gave the president their blessing, if you will, and then I got asked. Next slide. Okay. It took 897 days from the day that Donald Trump was elected to the day that I was confirmed. Senate vote, it is really good if you can go through a vote where it's just a consensus vote. But no, not in my case. The Democrats didn't want me to go and worked overtime to try to uh, scuttlebutt my nomination. Next slide. In the end of the day, I got 63 votes, 50 uh, Republicans, and 13 Democrats which gave me a tremendous amount of standing that I could go and represent our country as a whole. I had told the president that I wasn't interested in just representing the Republican Party or him, but that the ambassador was there to represent the entirety of our, of our great nation. And uh, of course, I took a listing of all of the Democrats who voted uh, against me and uh, made it a point to go and thank them for their support, even though they didn't vote for me. One of the best days of my life was taking the oath of office. Next slide. Um, I have to tell you that I don't get emotional very often. And uh, this is just a little ceremony off on the side of the State Department. They have a much bigger celebration later, but they want you to get the oath of office the same, almost the same day that you're confirmed. And so we trotted over there, my wife and I. And 
these words, when I read out loud these words, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, this chill went through my body. Like, I, it's very, very hard to explain. And uh, my wife said, that's the happiest that you've looked. They snapped this picture of me. This is immediately after I took the oath of office. My wife said, I haven't seen a smile on that face of yours for 897 days. So it was a, it was a real torturous journey, to say the least, but it was worth every step of the way. Okay, what's it like working with the president? Everybody wants to know this because he's controversial, to say the least. Um, so this is my first meeting with him. I was only one of five ambassadors that was invited into the Oval Office just before you go out to post. And I'm sitting there with him with uh, the National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien, one of my handlers from the State Department, uh, Tim Linderking, who's now in charge of the Lemon, uh, uh, Yemen file, and then Casey Evans, who is the director of a Middle Eastern policy for the National Security Council. And he wanted to ask me a couple questions. He wanted to see me before I left. And so the first question he said to me was, what are your priorities? Personal. Now, the country has a strategy. The State Department has a strategy. The embassy has a country strategy. And... He wants to know now, what are my priorities? And so I said to him, Mr. President, I don't know what my priorities are. I would like the ability to go out to post. And let me just say one thing. We have a, a you know, you can take pictures, but no posting on site. On, on, on um, Sir? Sir? No posting on social media? Okay, you can take the pictures, but I, I don't want them posted on social media, okay? Great. I don't have a problem with you taking the pictures. I just don't want them on social media just causes way too many problems. So um, he then says, great, I think that's a great idea. Number two, and this is the big thing, he says to me, how can I help you? I was stunned. The President of the United States is asking me how he can help me. So there had been this controversy about the F-35. Now, I don't know if you all know what the F-35 is, but it is the most powerful weapons program in the world. It is a jet fighter cost $200 million to buy one of them, you can't see it. Radar can't see it, the Russians can't see it, the Chinese can't see it. That, in addition to all of the sophisticated electronics and communications that are embedded in the airplane, allows us not to have the fog of war. And we've only allowed it to be purchased by 11 countries, our best allies, Denmark, England, Germany, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, just to name a few. Canada. rest of them, they don't get it. Can't touch it. Too many secrets. And the Emiratis wanted it. The Emiratis wanted us to say to them, you are one of our strategic allies because they felt forlorn because what happened in the Obama administration with the JCPOA. JCPOA is the nuclear deal that Obama struck with Iran with the promise that they would stop their nuclear program. In return, we would allow them to have full access to banking, all their money back, be able to trade in dollars and a host of other things, sell oil on the world market. That JCPOA allowed the Iranians to get $200 billion during the Obama administration. And that money was supposed to have been used to help build their middle class and their institutions. And instead, what the Iranians did with that money was to fund the Houthis and the Hezbollah and Hamas and other terrorist groups to try to bring down both Israel and other autocratic governments in the Middle East and to stick it in the nose of the United States of America. So these countries were, needless to say, pissed off big time. And that's the environment that I was going into not even knowing it. The second thing that they were mad about was the Obama administration's embracing of the Muslim Brotherhood. They saw the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, plain and simple. The Obama administration saw the Muslim Brotherhood as two parts. Part A, yes, terrorism. Part B, a beginning on the march toward democracy. And we won't get into what happened in Egypt when the Muslim Brotherhood took over, but if you're really interested in this, you should read about that. And the F-35 became a demonstration of the United States and our commitment to 
the Emiratis. Next slide. I bring it up because nobody knew what the president's position was. The president had only told John Bolton and he never revealed it and got fired in May of 19, uh, 2019 and replaced by Robert O'Brien. And so I'm out to post, going out to post, not knowing where the president is. So I figured that if I knew where he was, I could resolve this tension that was going on between the State Department and the Defense Department. Half the, half the administration said, let's give them it, let them buy it. The other half said, no, they can't be trusted. And besides, Israel will never have it. And so I bring up, out of the blue, to the president, right in front of those four guys, and little did I know, there's 50 standing behind me. It all filtered into the room, generals and other State Department and national security officials. The president looks at me, mm -hmm. and he waves his hand in a very slight manner, and he says to everybody, help the ambassador make it happen. We knew instantly where he was on this issue. So I leave there and realize that access is one of the biggest things that ambassadors can have and whether if you're not a political ambassador with close ties to the administration, you've got to work through the State Department. And every career diplomat has to work through the State Department. There's no way a diplomat coming up through the State Department can go and have the kind of conversation I just had with the president. You've got to go through step by step by step by step, six layers of bureaucracy before you can get to the president. And they never get to him. Next slide. I leave there. And I go over to the National Security Advisor's office to talk a little bit more about what happened in the meeting that we just had. And between myself and Robert O'Brien is Victoria Coates. And she is the Deputy National Security Advisor. And the National Security Advisor says to me, this is your person. Work through her. If you get stuck, come to me. I'll go to the president. And they take this picture and they send it out in a short press relief to the United Arab Emirates, ran in the newspapers there, which essentially say, this is our guy. You've got the political ambassador you've always wanted. You're on your way. And I left with all these credentials, knowing the F-35, and believe me, back then, anything that happened in the White House was leaked. So the Emiratis knew more about what had happened by the time I got there than I did. Next slide. I get there. And you don't actually become the ambassador until you present your papers to the country. And there's 130 countries that have embassies in Abu Dhabi. As a result of that, they don't take everybody the day you get there. They package you up, wait for a while. And it turns out that there are 13 other ambassadors that have been waiting for six months to present their papers. And when I got there, the Emiratis rushed to get me my papers so I could become official. And I get in line uh, to present my papers, and they tell me this story about how only one of us get to speak. And in this case, it's going to be the ambassador of Norway. He had been there for 14, uh, since uh, he'd been there for, um, for six months. And I would have been seventh in line. Fine, it's okay with me. And as we approach to present our papers, an uh, aide of uh, Sheikh Maktoum comes over to me and says, Ambassador, the sheikh, uh, the prime minister, would like you to give the opening remarks. And I said, thank you very much, but I've heard that it's the ambassador from Norway's turn. You should really let him do it. There was this pause, and he said, I don't think you heard me. <laughs> the prime minister would like you to give the remarks. And I said, thank you very much. And I had about 30 seconds in which to concoct something that would be good. And I often label this as it had nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the power of the United States of America. And until you go overseas and get away from our media, you have absolutely no idea how strong a country we have, how we are revered in almost all parts of the globe, including the Middle East. And they look to us for guidance and strength. Next slide. So what's the first problem? How do we keep the Emiratis close? First problems, Expo. Next slide. I stop by Jared Kushner's office. On the way out, there's a little note slipped to me as I'm walking out of the Oval Office, and it says, uh, see Jared Kushner, and I walk into his office. I 
never really spent any time with him and he looks at me and he says, Fix Expo. Fix Expo. Next slide, please. Expo was the World's Fair that we have participated in for 150 years. It was one of the fundamental pillars of us winning the Cold War. And we can't even get funding to participate. We needed $60 million and Congress had rejected it. Said, no, we're not going. Why aren't we going? Democrats wouldn't approve it. They were in charge of Congress. Okay? Now, in all fairness to the Democrats, the Republicans had did exactly the same thing to them six years later in 2014 in Italy. The Democrats had put up some funding for Expo there and the Republicans shot it down. So I had to figure out a way. He said, fix it. How do you fix it? Where are you going to get $60 million? Next slide. I get there on July, uh, excuse me, November 7th, and I go and see this uh, minister. Her name is Reem El Hashimi, uh, 42 years old. Uh, she's running uh, Expo. I sit down with her and I basically say, uh, Your Excellency, I'm sorry, we're not coming. And she's stunned. She had been told for two years not to worry about it. Everything was lined up. And for me to come and say this to her just floored her. And she looked at me and she said, what should we do? We can't have an expo without the United States of America. And besides, do you realize that we have spent $10 billion getting ready for this? I thought long and hard. And I looked at her and I said, Your Excellency, my father told me, when I was a young boy, never spend other people's money. And she looked at me and she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, exactly what I said. I'm not in a position to tell you how to spend your money. We left. She called a couple days later and she said, please come down and see me. And I did. And she said, I have a question to ask you. Would you accept $60 million gift from the United Arab Emirates government? And I said, I would. Absolutely, but I'm no longer running the show like I did my own company. I'm going to have to go back and I'm going to have to run this up the flagpole. I did, and I ran back to the embassy, you know, my chest all puffed up, and you know, I had this really big win, and everybody, all my direct reports looked at me and they said, well, it sounds nice, but you can't take the money. Why not? Well, it's humiliating to the United States to have a little country like the UAE have to give us $60 million to participate. And I said, well, what's, more, what's worse, not participating? They said, well, it's probably illegal anyway, so you don't have any support from us. So then I went on this one-month journey all the way up like a regular ambassador would do. And every place I went, the answer was either I can't make this decision or no. Next slide, please. Oh, by the way, this is the deal that her and I cut. $60 million cash transfer. They would build a pavilion, we would manage it, um, and all they wanted in return was a promise that we would use the money like it was intended for, not take the money and then find a reason not to, uh, not to participate. Um, so I end up having an appointment with the Secretary of State on January 2nd, 2020, to plead my case. Next slide. What happens on January 2nd, while I'm sitting in the waiting room to see the Secretary of State, little did I know that there was an action against General Soleimani, who's a number two person in the Republican National Guard and uh, Revolutionary Guard, and um, they'd killed him. And Pompeo was in the Situation Room watching this and being part of the operation. And I'm sitting in his office and they come out and they say to me, Mr. Ambassador, he's not coming back today. And I was heart sick because I didn't know this was going on. So I left the office, went back to New York. And as I got off the train, I got a phone call from the State Department. They said, come back. We want to talk to you. And next slide. So I go back the next morning very early. And I tell my case to Mike Pompeo. And he agrees with me. And he says, yes to Expo. You can take the money. Next slide, please. But he says under only one condition. You are going to get a second job in the administration. You are not only going to be the ambassador now, but you're also going to be the commissioner general for Expo. 
And I, at that moment, said, you know, there is providence in the world, divine providence. I'm in the construction business. I live under these kind of pressures every day. I know schedules. I know how to build things. And I said, I don't know how I got to this point in time. Somebody else upstairs knows, but my, aunt, my prayers have been answered. I now get to do something that I really know how to do. Next slide. So go through these rapidly. On February 1st, we start construction. That's me and my fellow Emiratier. Uh, I'm about half his size, and uh, he really, um, uh, you know, he was a real taskmaster. I went down to the job site every single week for one, almost one year to make sure it got built right. Next slide. Um, we brought uh, Elon Musk's uh, Falcon rocket there as one of the main exhibits of the U.S. pavilion. Next slide, please. And this is what it looked like on uh, November uh, 15th. Nine months, six weeks later, we got the whole thing done. And of course, no sooner that happened, COVID appeared, and the thing was delayed by one year. But at least we accomplished it. Next slide, please. That was the first problem. That allowed the Emiratis to re-establish its faith in the United States and in our government. There are a lot of people that accomplished that. I just happened to be the guy on the uh, tip of the spear. The second problem was stale and stagnant communications and discussions. We as a country have dealt from a position of arrogance for many, many years. We think that it's our way or the highway, and they do this in a way where you sit at these tables, you've seen them all the time with the communists sitting on one side and we on the other side. Everybody reads from a little yellow and, uh, or green book. They have their book. You read your talking points. They all come from Washington. You break up, and maybe in two or three or four or five months, you sit down again. That's not how businessmen do business. We get in a room and we arm wrestle and we have these conversations that are frank. So let's go to the next slide. So I get out there. And the first thing I do is I sit down with my staff and I say, what are our problems? What are the issues facing the United States and, and the UAE? And they say, one guy says this, one person says that. I said, well, do you have an executive summary? Is there a list? No, there's no list. I mean, wait a minute, there's no list of the problems so we can at least check them. No, there's no list at all. So I created a two-day retreat in my office. We got a big whiteboard about the size of this screen. I was the scribe, and we sat there for two days listing and understanding every single problem that the United States had, every single one. And this is what it looked like. And I then used this talking point to then go and visit with 30 ministers within the UAE my first 60 days. And I got an earful about every one of these things and how our conversation is stale and stagnant. And we can't make any progress. And we're really worried that the United States is pulling ourselves away from the Middle East. Next slide. I went back home on December 15th, went to see the National Security Advisor, and I reported what I just said to you. I said, if we don't find another way to communicate with the Emiratis, if we're going to use this tried and proven old diplomatic jargon, we're not going to get any closer to them whatsoever. He said, Ambassador, I'm going to allow you the opportunity to conduct a strategic dialogue with the Emiratis under the auspices of the National Security Council, not the State Department. And so I invited them on January 10th, 2020, to engage in a strategic dialogue with us, which is a very, very broad and complicated set. You have to get approval from many, many agencies in our government. And we fast track all of that. Next slide, please. So the strategic dialogue started on political uh, alignment, security, intelligence, counterterrorism, law, commerce, human rights, culture, education, and space. We created committees and we worked diligently for six months. Next slide, please. And we had this COVID going on and we couldn't meet in person and so we had these this is an example of a committee and the reporting out. It was all done via Zoom, uh, behind uh, closed doors. And the only two people that were able to meet face-to-face -face were myself and this guy in the white robe. His name is Dr. Anwar Gargash, and he, is, uh, he was the uh, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, the number two person in their foreign ministry. Next slide, please. On 624, uh, we were 90% done. We had reached all these agreements on these issues. Uh, but you'll notice that I say we're done on 624, but if you look at the date on the letter, 
Um, that is 24. That letter, however, didn't actually get fully signed and everything until well after the Abraham Accords were approved. That actually happened in November when we finally were able to button the whole thing up. Next slide, please. Government's very slow in the paperwork. This is he and I signing uh, the declaration in terms of the strategic dialogue. Next slide. Now, using soft power. Next slide. Anybody familiar with the Magellus system? So they have this thing there called the Magellus. And it's basically a meeting space. They meet all the time together. And this is where behind closed doors in private you have these intense, open, frank communications on issues that you haven't been able to solve. This is how their society operates. We as, uh, as, as diplomats, we had to operate in the very rigid uh, conference room with talking points from, the, um, from back from Washington. And so they invited me to join the Majlis of the top security uh, uh, top official of the Emirati. So every Tuesday night, my wife and I would go over to his home. He'd have you know, 20, 30, 40 people there. They'd have a wonderful dinner, serve camel every single night. Um, <laughs> and uh, you had to eat it. So, I mean, that's another thing you got to get sort of used to. By the way, it tastes like a combination of pork and... Uh, Oh, yeah, uh, Terry wanted me. They offered her the eyeballs as a delicacy one time. And she, she, she said, well, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, and this is me sitting there in the Magellus. I just want to sort of a reminder of what a really a wonderful time it was. And you could say anything you wanted. I mean, I said to them, can we have some intellectual tension? Uh, can we have some disagreement? I mean, you know, we don't seem to have any. Everybody just in these meetings, we don't seem to make any progress. And this is where I learned very, very quickly that the Emiratis were no different than us. And you had to get down and break bread, put the issues on the table, and start to listen and find areas of compromise. Next slide, please. So, comes my wife's part. And this is how we were seed, uh, seen by the Emiratis and by the press as we began to roll out this soft power. Um, they noticed it. And they began to report on it. We had a nice segment on CNN International by Becky Anderson came over to the house and did a wonderful presentation. And we had various articles in the newspapers. Next slide. So what did she do? Well, number one, my wife loves animals. This is a Saluki. Uh, the Saluki is the national dog of the UAE. It's like a greyhound, except it's faster than a greyhound. And they race them. But when they're done at 18 months, they let them go into the desert, and they, 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 they die. And so Terry joined a rescue mission, and the entire time there we had a couple of Saluki rescue dogs as we were preparing for them to go to adoptions all over the world. And this happens to be the one that we brought back with us. Her name is Ishba. So they loved her for that. Next, camels. They're big on camels. I can't tell you how many camel fairs we went to. We let the camels kiss us, and, and, and we learned all about the camel beauty contest. And we, the, it was really quite amazing. Next slide. Then she came upon this idea of art. Now, you may know about this program called Art in the Embassy. It's an official program for the State Department. It allows ambassadors to go to the government collection, whether in the State Department or the National Gallery or the Smithsonian, and take art with you out to your residence. And you don't put it in the embassy. You actually put it in the CMR, which stands for the Chief of Missions Residence. By the time we went out after 897 days, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff left. So we stood there in the gallery, the two of us, and said, what are we going to do? And I said... Let's buy art. Let's show the Emiratis that we've always wanted to start a collection. Let's start a Middle Eastern art collection. So we went out there with this idea that we were going to start to buy art. I didn't realize it was going to get how out of control it got. Next slide, please. So we started buying art. And we used the residence as a mini museum, putting all of this Middle Eastern art in it. And the first piece was this one on the left. It was a 4,000-pound marble sculpture of an Iranian student on his way to the gallows. And when my wife saw this, actually was in London, she was absolutely taken aback by it. She said, you cannot believe the emotion that this evokes 
when you sin there and you think about your old children simply for protesting, getting beheaded. Yes, and it's a real event, and this is a, a, a carved statue out of, a, of, out of a real person. On the right is a bust of Sheikh Zayed. Sheikh Zayed is the founder of the country. Think of George Washington. That's how important he is to the UAE. And he's the guy that brought all seven of these emirates together to create this federation called the United Arab Emirates. She then started buying more. Next slide. Uh, every one of these has a message in it. And these are not small uh, pieces of art. This, this one right here, I call it suspicion because of the eyes. Uh, this is six foot tall by four foot wide. The picture to the right is an Iraqi uh, artist who was drafted and became a prisoner of war in the Iraqi-Iranian War. Next slide. And so it goes with either photography, this is the uh, uh, Emirati and uh, uh, Muslim uh, depiction of the Piata. This is a mother, uh, her son being, being killed by the government. Uh, here you have an arrest. Uh, of a student. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is very interesting, the run on the right. It was painted back in the early 2000s, and it actually is a painting of the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. It was commissioned by the CIA. Um, the uh, CIA thought that the artist was going to give it to them. They said, no, no, I, you have to pay for it, and the CIA didn't want to pay for it, so he kept it. And uh, he's one of the most famous artists. These are both his works. The second one on the right is actually the bombing in Beirut. That's true. The artist was a little boy, and as he walked by our embassy after it was bombed, he saw our flag up the next day, and he said, I never, ever forgot the strength of democracy and how that made just life impression on me. He became this very, very famous artist from Lebanon, and these are two pieces that we were able to collect. He, he sold us this, not in the beginning, we had, we had approached him, but when he saw what we were doing in terms of this collection, he then called us up and he said, I've made a mistake, I want to come and meet you, and uh, he allowed us to buy both these paintings from him. Next slide, please. So this is what it looked like in our residence. So when we started having dinners and receptions, all this artwork was on display for Emiratis and anybody else who wanted to come and see it. And so we began to get this reputation for using soft power as opposed to hard power. Um, next slide, please. And finally, the one that struck me the most is the one on the left. These are called peace chairs. They're about twice the size of the chairs that you're sitting in, done by a Palestinian artist. And his message was, until those chairs are completely closed, there will never be peace in, in, um, in, uh, in, in the Middle East. And then my wife had the guy who had done the two paintings before paint this um, painting of me signing the uh, strategic dialogue. Next slide. So all that soft power allowed the royal family, for the first time in the history of our relationship with them, came to our residence to view this, uh, these art works of art and talked about it extensively with us. Now let's go over to hard power and let's go through these rather quickly. We as a country, by the way, we spend $65 billion a year on soft power as a country. We spend $1 trillion a year on hard power. And I'm not here to talk against hard power. We need it. It's important. It's that billy club that we have, but we don't use soft power as effectively as we could. That's the one thing I learned as ambassador. Next slide, please. So first thing is you get to do as ambassador, you get to go out and visit the troops. This is my itinerary for the day that I flew out to the aircraft carrier, the uh, Harry S. Truman, in a Greyhound uh, twin-engine plane, landed on the deck to greet and to, you know, encourage our 4,000 sailors and airmen that were out there uh, doing their thing. And that's how close you are to Iran, and of course there's this big risk that you take that uh, you could be a casualty. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my general, uh, um, Keith Phillips. A uh, 42-year-old general who was my uh, uh, defense attache, he was with me 24 hours a day. Uh, my security briefings, my, my daily CIA brief, he was there to put context and all these other kind of things. Next slide, please. This is the aircraft carrier. Next slide, please. Uh, you get to go out and visit the troops. They're under camouflage. They're in the desert. Uh, they're there to protect the interests of the United States of America. Next slide, please. Risk. This is a big thing. 
you don't realize how much risk you personally take until you actually get there. Next slide, please. So this is my detail. Every day, no matter where I went, these are the number of people that went with me to protect me against the Iranians. And what I failed to tell you was on January 7th, remember that General Suleimani thing? Well, I had a couple of people outside my office saying if they could come in and see me. It was a legal officer of the embassy. And he came in and he said to me, Ambassador, I have the duty to report that there is a threat on your life. And I said, really? Why? He said, well, this General Suleimani thing, the, we've, got, we've collected intelligence that the Emiratis had sent several cells out, spanning the world, trying to get an ambassador or a principal of the United States government in retaliation. And we have uncovered a cell that have entered the UAE. And so we're going to have to beef up your protection. And these pictures you're seeing now are what happened after that meeting. Next slide, please. They said to me, this is the first time in a long time we're going to have to protect your wife. And these are the guards that were assigned to my wife for about 90 days until the threat assessment uh, lowered. Next slide, please. When we traveled within the country, they replaced women with men. And this was Terry's sort of security detail when we would go to Sharjah or Al Shekhaima. Next slide, please. This is what stood outside the embassy all the time. And I wondered to myself, You've heard a friendly fire. You wonder if you ever got out and somebody wanted to be a hero and get the 70, uh, whatever they got in heaven. Uh, but this guy turned out to be a wonderful Emirati. I made sure I brought him donuts and coffee whenever I could, but we, we struck up a pretty good relationship. And I was happy that every time I saw him, he gave me a sort of a little smirky smile. Next slide, please. If I was, a, I'm a big cyclist. When I went cycling, they surrounded me with cars and people to make sure that somebody couldn't swerve into me. Um, it was one in front, one in the back, two on the sides, and so I would ride along the road in this little cocoon of other cars. Next slide, please. We would go and stay in a hotel. This is what it looked like 24 hours a day outside our hotel room. Uh, you couldn't get away from it at all. Next slide, please. All right, this is what you all came here for, the Abraham Accords. But there was a lot of lead up to the Abraham Accords. It just getting that government together with us didn't happen overnight. It only took six weeks. Although in May of 2019, Ambassador Yosef Oteba called up Jared Kushner and asked if he could visit him personally. Went to his house and he said in, no, in, in May of 19, that he was delivering a personal message from MBZ. MBZ is the leader of UAE. MBS is the leader of Saudi Arabia, just so we keep them separate. And that they wanted to normalize with Israel under certain conditions. And that started in November of, um, I mean, excuse me, in May of 19, this journey toward the Abraham Accords. The Emiratis who wanted to do it. We assisted. That's the role that the United States played. And we resisted by solving the problems. We assisted by giving them the F-35. But we mostly assisted by what they really wanted. And what they really wanted was a security and economic relationship with Israel. Because every time we spoke about Israel, the Emirati principles would say to me that there is no other country in the world that they admire as much as Israel. And I would say, well, why? And they would say, can you imagine? Here we are a country about the same size, 10 million people. We have oil. that We have so much oil, we don't know what to do with it. So we have unlimited capital. Israel has no natural resources. They don't even have water. They don't have arable land. They have no energy. How did they do it? How is this people able to become the startup, now the scale-up nation? And they came to the conclusion it was because of the culture. And they wanted to tap into that culture. They wanted to become innovative. They wanted to become creative. They wanted a trading partner. They admired, and this is why, and of course they both have Iran breathing down their neck. Next slide, please. So they had a big relationship before. It was just under the table. And it had grown as hard and as fast as it could under the table. They had to become outside the table and thus, the Abraham Accords concept was born. Next slide, please. 
This is uh, my little world. This is MBZ with our negotiating team, General Correa, uh, Victoria Coates and myself in July of 2020, putting the final touches on the accords. Next slide, please. And this is the accord. It isn't anything special. It's what every human being wants. It's not a big treaty. It doesn't have a lot of promises. There's no promises at all. The entire thing is aspirational. And I'm not going to read every one of these comments, but those comments that you see on the right are exactly the words that are in the Abraham Accords. It's only 236 words. I think only 140 of them are actually important. And also, and you see on the right, there are about 60. You know, it's things like cooperation and dialogue, dignity, hope, science, art, and medicine, and radicalization, which is a nice way of saying terrorism, um, providing for children with a better future. This is what the Emiratis are all about. And so it wasn't hard for all the people, Bahrain, United States. By the way, United States is not a party to the Abraham Accords. We are only a witness to this aspirational statement and declaration that three countries made, Israel, Bahrain, and the UAE. Next slide, please. I got invited to go to Washington on September 15th to celebrate. Next slide. The president was really nice. He put me in the sort of the head of the line. You can see me standing there between Mike Pence and uh, Secretary uh, um, Pompeo. Uh, the guy standing next to the president is uh, His Highness Sheikh, uh, Abdullah Ben Zayed, he's their foreign minister. Three brothers run the country, MBZ, TBZ, and ABZ. Next slide, please. Not hard to remember. This is the big meeting in the Oval Office. I'm sitting there next to Jared. Here's the president in the lower left. Uh, had a really nice, uh, these kind of things, these are photo ops. I mean, you, know, you reiterate everything had been done before, but there's nothing really hard done in these meetings. It's more of a celebratory kind of a get together. Next slide, please. Uh, now the hard work begins. So September 15th, we, we, we signed the dialogue. They signed the dialogue. But now we have to put into place all of the technical uh, and administrative things to connect these countries. And the very first one has to happen is commercial flights. You can't do anything without commercial flights. And unfortunately, in order to get an airplane from Tel Aviv to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, you have to fly over Saudi Arabia. So you just think about this. If Saudi Arabia doesn't give you flyover rights, you're not doing this. And if you don't have commercial flights, you're not doing the Abraham Accords. And so the, so the, so the Saudis get a really big uh, a thank you for allowing these commercial flights to take place. And really it sends a signal that you shouldn't forget that the Saudis are next. And we would have had the Saudis in March or April of 2021 had we not lost the White House. And this is just all the people coming together celebrating that, um, that first flight. Next slide, please. This is the number one highlight for me of my entire ambassadorship. It's seven hours after that flight landed. We're standing in the palace of, the, um, of one of the rulers of the country, and we're celebrating, and all three, four countries get to say something. Jared Kushner on behalf of the United States, uh, His Excellency um, uh, Taknoon Ben Zayed, who's the National Security Advisor for the UAE, uh, the National Security Advisor for Bahrain, and then us, uh, and then, excuse me, the, the Israelis. And the Israeli um, National Security Advisor is Mayor Ben Shabbat. And when it comes his time to speak, he grabs a microphone, and he then says this, that in a young boy when he was five or six years old, every night he went to bed wondering if the next morning he would wake up alive. And he always wondered what it would be like to be standing or just visiting an Arab nation when those borders and those walls would be torn down. And here he finds himself on this day, in this place, with this accord, not only speaking Hebrew, but being able to, when he turns to uh, at TBZ, and he says, may I say a prayer? And he then says a prayer in Hebrew. And there's like nine guys and three women in the room, and including myself, there's not a dry eye in the place. We knew at that moment, regardless of what happened from that point forward, what a special moment this was 
to be able to celebrate these Abraham Accords and how we had turned the corner with the Bahrainis and the uh, Emiratis and that we had this opportunity as a world to put the past behind us and to begin marching forward to peace and prosperity for all. Next slide, please. So as we were approaching the end, uh, you know, by this time we had lost the election. We knew that uh, July tw January 20th was coming forth. And uh, we're just going to go through a couple of pictures and we'll wrap it up. Um, we all won the National Security Medal from the president. Um, it's been given out 97 times since World War II, it was created by Henry, by uh, Harry Truman. Next slide. The purpose is it is for distinguished achievement while uh, you're in office. This is mine. These are the people that got it, Secretary Pompeo, um, uh, Jared Kushner, uh, O'Brien, uh, Avi Berkowitz, um, Ambassador Friedman, Ambassador Fisher, who, by the way, is a resident of Palm Beach. He was an ambassador to Morocco, and they eventually came on right at the end of the administration, and then myself. Next slide, please. And then I was honored by the Emiratis by giving me the top civilian uh, foreign honor. Uh, they awarded me the uh, Zayed II medal. Uh, and uh, this is the presentation that Anwar Gargash gave to me. I brought those, if you cared to see them, they're big. I really don't ever know what to do with them. So when you have a little luncheon like this, you can come and sort of show them off a little bit. But um, this is a testament to the greatness of our country and what we can accomplish if we use soft power. The Abraham Accords was not created by hard power. It was created by soft power, understanding, listening. Second, uh, next, next slide. That's what, the, that's what it looks like. Please, next slide. Um, at the embassy farewell, they gave me the flag on the last day that I was there, flown over the embassy. Next slide, please. And we had a farewell dinner uh, with the leadership of the country. Uh, everybody was shocked that my wife was invited all the time with, with the leadership of the country. This just doesn't happen. And that, that really saying two things, show the respect that they have for the United States of America and the respect for soft power and the respect for everything that my wife did to help advance the, uh, the relationship. Next slide, please. Then the big, really the last big thing. Does anybody know what kintsugi is? I didn't. So it's a Japanese art form and it's intended to celebrate mistakes. And why mistakes? are what we as humans can use to better ourselves. Next slide, please. So just before we left, Taknoon Ben Zayed invites me over to his palace and wants to say goodbye. And I'm sitting there with him. Next slide, please. And he presents me with this letter. And this letter basically says to embrace the imperfect and how he wants the end of my public time in office to stop but for us to develop a relationship on a private basis going forward. And it's really sort of a very heartfelt message that's in here. And this embracing the perfect and being able to use that to strengthen your relationship as opposed to degrade your relationship. That, that those are the things when we can take something that was wrong and we can use it to bridge the gap, to close the differences, to compromise, to admit to our mistakes, to make our relationship stronger because the more you do this, according to Taknoon um, uh, uh, Ben Zayed, the stronger that relationship gets over time. Next slide, please. So we get down on the floor and his aides tell my wife, we have never seen the sheik down on the floor. We get these rubber hammers and there's two big pots like this and we break them. And this is the end of one relationship. And then he, his staff gathers up all these pieces and they work feverishly overnight. And the next day, just before we leave, they present us with our new pot. All this is glued back together to show that this pot is actually prettier and more beautiful, broken and repaired than it would have been than if it was just the plain pot in itself. Oh, yes, it's gold. It's not just glue, it's gold. So, so let's go to the next slide. So that's it. I'm happy to, um, I know I took a little longer, but he said, he said I got seven minutes. She said um, 1.30. Oh, is that inspiring? Oh, 
Hi, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Judy Miller. I've covered the Middle East for many, many, many years, and the UAE is one of my favorite places to visit. What do you think now it will take to get Saudi Arabia to sign on to the, Arab, the Abraham Accords? And uh, what about the tension now between MBZ and MBS over the way he's running his country as opposed to the UAE? Thank you. I'm not aware of any real tension between MBS and MBZ. There, there may be from an external basis, but I think that the, the Emiratis are very calm people. And um, the tension that is developing has to do with, you know, there's five or six million uh, Saudis that would vacation in the UAE. And that balance of payment, MBS is trying to stop. So that competition that you sense is going to always be there. They're going to have to learn as a society that competition is uh, the spice of life and it's what makes us all better. What was the second part of your question? It will take the Biden administration a more focused view on the Middle East. Um, I've asked this question a hundred times to Biden uh, administration officials and their answer is we're still very interested in the Middle East, but we have other issues around the world that are more pressing. China, Russia, Ukraine, energy. And so, you know, for the first two years, the Biden administration wouldn't even breathe the word Abraham Accords. Matter of fact, for the first 90 days, it was forbidden to even use the word Abraham Accords. And the first uh, press secretary, Jan Pasek, uh, she said in May of 2021 that the Abraham Accords were dead on arrival uh, to the White House. Now, I think that was an overstatement, and I think it may have been for political consumption as opposed to, but this has had a very, very big effect on the Emiratis, as you know. They are still feeling for, forlorn and have turned toward, um, toward um, China for many of the needs that we used to provide to them. And um, I think the United States, the last thing I'll say is the United States has to get used to the fact that it's no longer a unipolar world, that we have world competition, that China's here to stay, and we're going to have to find a way to rationalize that, to deal with it, and to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Yes, sir. So if you saw the intelligence that I saw, which most of it's not reported in the press, for the simple fact that we're very worried that if you knew, if they knew we knew something, they would know how we got it. And if they knew how we got it, they would eliminate how we got it. And that includes people and systems and processes. I can only say this, that Iran revolutionary government is a kind of a society that the world does not need. It's a criminal enterprise where only 2 million Iranians are benefiting from it. The other 80 million are not. And it'll eventually fall. It will not fall from external pressure other than perhaps some economic things that we're doing. It'll fall internally. And every time they have these protests, they supposedly have killed, uh, I understand, uh, just this time around 5,000 people because of the protests. These are mostly students. And um, they know that they're skating on thin ice. So um, it is believed that one of my most favorite, favorite, and he's come here many times, uh, Peter Zion comes to the um, Four, Outs, uh, Four Arts uh, Council. He was just here uh, last week. If you read Peter Zion, Peter Zion says that Iran and the United States, once this regime has fallen, will become strong allies. And it's because several things that Iran has the United States likes. One, they have the closest thing to a democracy in the Middle East today. They have institutions that control the vote. I'm not saying that it's working, but they have a history of this. Number two, they have great educational institutions. They're rich in natural resources. They're a large country of approaching 100 million people. 
Um, and uh, they're, they're not, they're, even under this regime, they're not under, quote, autocratic rule in the sense of one man, one rule. So that's where we'll be headed, but whether it's going to take 25 years or 50 years, I, I don't know. Um, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your service. Uh, my question is, last evening I was with a former Prime Minister of Israel, he was, Naftali Bennett, who was in town and speaking, and he was wildly excited about the Abraham Accords, and he inherited from his predecessor, Netanyahu, who's now back in power with a very slim minor majority. Do you think the volatility of the Israeli leadership is causing Saudi Arabia to hesitate to join the Abraham Accords? And do you think that uh, it's possible that the instability of the Israeli government will make it more difficult for the Abraham Accords? When you're there, when, what you realize is that Israel and the Gulf nations have much, much more in common than they have in opposition. There isn't any countries that don't have problems between each other. The question is, is that do you have the infrastructure to be able to solve those problems by meeting and dialoguing and coming to some compromise resolution? What the Emiratis, and I know them best, the differences sometimes cause things to go slower than they should. The Emiratis are not as assertive as Israelis are. And we're not just talking 5 or 6% or 10%. We're talking factors of 5, 10, 15. The Emirati culture is very laid back. It takes a very long time for them to trust you. Not days or weeks or months, but years and decades. Um, uh, so that's, that's much different than Israel. Israel, you know, it's a, like, almost like cage fighting, if you will. I mean, you know, you can be somebody's enemy on one time, but if there's a good business deal over here, uh, you can mend fences and come back very, very quickly. That's not, that's not Emirati society. And so while I was there, they were having a hard time adjusting to the assertiveness of, of, of Israel uh, and preferred to go a little slower. And you have to remember that there are ways of measuring how a society adapts to something. And the way that this happens is, is that you can first hear what the leadership of the country actually says. Secondly, you can then look at the editorials. And in the Gulf nations, these editorials are basically organs of, of the government. So then you can go on a social media and you can measure off of social media. And I can tell you this because our State Department did a lot of measuring. The leadership, the top 100 people in the country, we're 1,000% in favor of the Abraham Accords. The editorials, on the other hand, were only 70% in favor of it. And there was occasional editorial that wasn't. Then you go to the social media and you find that the numbers were reversed. 30% of the population was in favor of it and 70% were against it. So now you would ask, well, who's the population? And you all must know that out of the 9 million people that live in the Emirates, only 850,000 are actually Emiratis. Everybody else is from somewhere else. So on social media, who are you measuring? Are you measuring the expats from India and Pakistan, United States and Australia? Or are you measuring that 800,000 Emiratis? And in that 800,000 Emiratis, we learned that anybody under 45 years old was wildly in favor of it. And anybody over 45 years old, given the history and the hatred and the indoctrination, were wildly against it. And so I often said to the ruler this, I admire you for your march toward modernity. And on the other hand, I'm glad I'm not you because only you know how far you can go before you rip your social, fabricate, fa social fabric to a point in time where instead of having evolution, you then morph into revolution. And so each country has its own dynamics. And only the people at the top actually know how those are dynamics. One of the failures of our country, I believe, is we push too hard, way too hard for our style of democracy. The Emirates call our style of democracy the big D, 
They call their style Little D. And there are lots of differences. And they don't believe that our style of democracy can work in their country, perhaps, ever. Yes. So when the Biden, when the um, Obama administration gave 200, the remarkable sum of $200 billion to Iran, were there no checks and balances on how to, they were to spend that money and, and to confirm or have any kind of um, verification? So, so if you recall, we sent over about $400 million in cash on an airplane, okay? And we did that because we had cut Iran off from the SWIFT system. So the SWIFT system is an electronic system that allows the world to trade in dollars. You cannot trade in dollars unless you're part of SWIFT. You don't, you don't generally send, if you have to pay somebody in another part of the country, you don't send cash. You send uh, wire transfer today. You can only send that wire transfer if you're using dollars by SWIFT. Every single SWIFT transaction goes through the Federal Reserve of New York. Every single one of them. We know where everybody's spending their money all over the world. Most, most Americans don't know that. Yeah, every single one. If you're a corresponding bank, has to be a member of the New York Fed, or you can't trade dollars. Now, no, no Iranian banks were part of SWIFT. So in order to get part one of the agreement, $400 million of all that money you have taken from us, this was Iranian money that was in the United States and all these banks, all these accounts that the Iranians had prior to 1979, we shipped them that money over on an airplane in cash. It was a big political snafu or whatever you want to call it, but it's the only way you could get them the money. That was number one. Number two, all the trade, not very little of that trade happened with the United States. All that trade we're talking about happened with Germany and China and France. Those are their big trading partners. We have no control of that. All right? But it did happen through SWIFT. They had sort of reestablished SWIFT. And three, what we really tried to check were they, were they adhering to the agreement about expanding their nuclear capabilities, and they just repeated what they did for decades before, and they cheated. And they're very, very, very good at cheating. They built underground caverns. They would prevent inspections from the nuclear agency around the world. Um, I have not been critical of the Obama administration for doing it. Look, you actually only know if you're there on the ground and you see all the detail that's going, going on. And it's enormously complicated to get anything done in government. But the checks and balances that the whole, by the way, it wasn't just the United States. There was the, what they call it, six plus one. There was China, Russia, Germany, France, United States. We were all part of that agreement. And, and by the time Trump got into office, he saw that the Iranians were cheating so badly and that their time to get a weapon was gone from one year or two years down to just a month or so. There's no reason to allow them access to all this money when they had cheated their way through the entire uh, the entire JCPOA. And of course, he pulled the plug and put uh, what they call sanctions back on Iran, which has really hurt Iran to this point in time. It will be one of the reasons if the government falls is partly due to the Trump's chank, uh, sanctions. Hi. Yeah. Um, loved your talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I've spent a little time in the Emirates, and um, I was very taken, maybe even hypnotized, by the level of luxury and um, attention to detail and how they treated me, you know, probably have never been treated as well in my life. But after a while, I realized that there's this very dark underbelly in these countries, the Pakistani guest workers. They're sp virtual slaves. So, you know, they take their passports. And th I remember in Dubai, they weren't allowed to work when the temperature was over 120 degrees. So they would raise the temperature, change the temperature so it never went above 120 degrees, things like that. So, you know, these people, uh, they're virtual slaves. So, I don't know, it's really kind of broke my heart after a while and I got this very sickening feeling about being there after a while because it was kind of disgusting actually the way they were treating people but um, my question is I'm sorry to go on but my trust question is um, why aren't the Emirates kinder to the Palestinians 
Okay, so let's take these one at a time. Number one, when were you there? Um, five years ago. Okay, so, so, so the idea, of, it, it, it is true that 10 years ago that they took the passports. Now, it wasn't the government that took the passports. The government does not hire the workers. There are companies that hired the workers and they took the passports and it is true that it wasn't against the law not to take the, pa to take the passports. So they took them. Sometimes they took them to keep them in safekeeping. Sometimes they took them because they wanted to send them home and they didn't want to, they needed them. That law has been changed five years ago. No longer can companies keep the passports of any worker. And those workers have to be um, allowed to leave upon their own volition. So that's number one. Um, that's that. Look, I, I had a company operating there for 10 years. This is this is this may have been one or two bad companies that did this. But my company, we the, the, the food program, the people the reason the people come and work there is a to earn money to be able to send home. Ninety percent of all the wages of those expats get sent back to their countries. They're there to make money for their families. Number two, wages, uh, food, housing and health care are part of the package. So I don't know where this idea came where we steal the food. Seven years ago may have, may, have, may have been different and there may have been isolated cases. But when my company was there, I went and investigated every single site we were building something on. And I can tell you that's not true. Um, number three, you said, what was your last question? The Palestinians. Okay, so this is, we're, we're going to get really deep here. So when you talk about helping the Palestinians, Half of the Palestinians live in the West Bank. Half the Palestinians live in camps in other Gulf nations and other Arab nations. There are 500,000 Palestinians living in labor camp in, uh, in Lebanon. Part of the reason why peace is so hard to get is because I believe, this is my own personal opinion, that they don't, they don't, the Arab nations don't want to deal with the Palestinians if they end up having an agreement with the Israelis. So you'll have that. Now let's just talk about the, um, the, the Emiratis. There's 350,000 Palestinians living in the, Arab, in the Arab Emirates. Every one of them has a job. Every one of them has a far better life than they would if they're living in Lebanon or Saudi Arabia or Syria. Um, in my discussions with them, the reason why they wanted to normalize was to stop Israel from its settlements. They were there to protect the Palestinians. They knew that if they didn't stop those settlements, there would never be a two-state solution. Three, the Emiratis had given the Palestinian Liberation Organization tens of billions of dollars over the last 20 years. And they're tired of it because they can't get peace. And they told that to me in my face. We're going in a different direction. We're no longer going to give that money to the authority to allow it to be put in Swiss bank accounts and for corruption to be rampant within uh, in their leadership. And most people in the Middle East that I dealt with believe that you will not see a breakthrough on peace, peace until the Abbas organization and his level of individuals are replaced by a younger set of people who want peace and prosperity and aren't going to fight about the three big issues that are separating Palestine and Israel. And one is the capital of Jerusalem. Two is the right to return and get your house. That'll never happen. And if that's the two conditions that they want, this isn't me that's saying this. This is what the Israelis are saying. And there are many Jewish people in the audience right here who know this only to be true. Okay. I'd like to pivot off one of the points you made during your very spectacular presentation. And that was the role that your wife played while you were there and the contribution she made. And I'm wondering if she might share with us a few of her most memorable moments. Uh, am I on? Oh, okay. um, well, when we went there, um, the, the Smithsonian took us over to their, uh, their bank of art to show us. And all they had left was actually Norman Rockwell prints, that type thing. And... I thought, no, this will never work for us when we get there. And John and I talked this over, and we thought, instead of Americans come because we have so many Americans and other people coming through the residence, you know, we have military congressmen, senators, businessmen, that we thought it'd be better for them to see the local regional art instead of seeing American art. 
And the, the reason why I wore the Abaya was because it was very, very comfortable. I bought all sorts of linen things from these designers, and I looked like an accordion the first day. The temperature is 120 and 130 degrees there. So the Abaya is just very, very lightweight, and it's very comfortable. And also, when you deal with the royals, and that's who you deal with because they run the whole country. They're part of everything. They like to see uh, women sort of dress modestly. You know, they like your, your collar on, your uh, wrists not showing. It's just part of the religion is a very modest exterior. So it really answered a lot of things that helped me. I just put the Abaya on. I had just Lululemon underneath it all the time. So I just had all these clothes I've never worn. I hope to wear them here. Um, and also... Oh, okay. Well, this is sort of like deep state stuff, but the you have to go to a spousal a school for the ambassador. So we had three weeks of training, and most of it was just how to set the table. There's, they they tell you the whole time that you're not important, that you have no rights of any sort, that you don't work for the United States government, you're on your own, you cannot ask anybody to do anything for you, you can't use the ambassador's car. If the ambassador's car is going by you, you're walking, it's 130 degrees, and it's going by you. If the, if the ambassador's not in the car, you can't get in. So you're not allowed to get in that car. And there, you, you, the, in fact, the wife of the ambassador in London, when she was there the first week, she got into the ambassador's car, and the Marine said to her, ma'am, you'll have to move. And she said, where? And he said, you have to sit over on the other side because if something happens, we really know, we have to know where the ambassador is in that car so we can get him out. So the wife said, well, what about me? And he said, ma'am, we'll do the best we can. And, and that's sort of the attitude. And the other thing was like during the spousal school, they said, well, you're in charge. There's, there's nothing that you can't ask anyone to do anything for you. It always has to go through the ambassador. He said, but you do have, this is after three weeks of indoctrination that you're really not much, you're, you're just collateral damage if anything happens. You know, don't worry about your security. John, when we first went there, had tons of security. And I said, well, what about me? And they went, oh, you know, you, 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 don't worry, nothing's going to happen. I said, no, a lot of things didn't add up. So um, they said, you do have one responsibility. And they said, in case of an immediate evacuation, your responsibility is to get the silver, by the way, it's silver plate, get the silver out of the um, residency and run it over to the embassy, which is like a half hour away. So while everybody else is getting on helicopters, I'm in charge of silver, oh running God. it to the embassy and then coming back. I said that, I thought that was rather insulting. In fact, you have separate, you have separate refrigerators, like where my food is compared to their food. Everything is like added up, you know, they, keep the bills. I mean, the United States government, they're very, very cheap with the ambassadors. And that's another reason why I think, in my own opinion, is that they have a lot of political ambassadors because career people can't afford, can't afford it. They give you $25 a person to take them to dinner. So $25 wouldn't even buy you a croissant in Dubai. So really the ambassadors put a lot of their own money into the gardens, like when some of the ambassadors went to Italy, the gardens were a mess. And so you put a, really put a lot of your own money. It, it costs you a lot to be an ambassador. You have to get rid of all your stock. We had to get rid of all our energy stocks. I mean, like, that doesn't sound like, oh, poor me. But, you know, it, it, it costs you in many different ways to serve your government. There's a lot of stories, but John won't let me tell them all. <laughs> Thank you. He'll be mad at me. Anybody else? One more. Last one. Okay. Okay. So let me start out by saying that I was duly impressed with every single individual that worked in my embassy. I didn't send one person home. 
and I said often that any person that was a direct report of mine that I knew well, if they ever needed a job back in the United States, I would hire them. That's how good they are. It isn't the individual that's the problem. It's a system and a thing called FAM, F-A-M, okay? Foreign Affairs Manual. The Foreign Affairs Manual is an encyclopedia of asking and answering questions that you may have. So this is all laid out for you about what you can and can't do. It doesn't leave any room for creativity, innovation, and of course, nobody wants to take a risk. They start out with thousands of young people at level one, and every three years you either get promoted, so I have the system called up or out. You either keep on going up or you get let go, go into the real world. And what ends up happening over 10 cycles like that or eight cycles like that, you begin to become a product of the bureaucracy. You're risk adverse, like on this um, two things I worked on. There was a career ambassador, they were like, all the people were like shocked that I would take a chance by going up that far to get approval to accept $60 million. But you knew it was the right thing to do. And they all were so happy when it happened. Oh, I got a million people. Oh, Ambassador, we're so glad we needed this. This was great. So it isn't the individual. I think that the State Department today isn't given enough money. It's number one. And number two, they're working in a system that was designed in the 50s. Slow. Slower and slowest. Today, it's fast, faster, and fastest with artificial intelligence on the horizon. One more example. All the Emirati top officials communicate two ways, cell phone and WhatsApp. If you were to send them an email message, you could wait till hell froze over before you got a response. In our embassy, you're not allowed to have a cell phone and you're not allowed to be on WhatsApp. So how do you communicate with the very people that are the most important? And they still haven't solved that. So when everybody goes, you go buy your own phone, and you do most of the stuff offline, okay? I can't tell you how many times um, the foreign minister wanted to talk to me and somebody would come in and say, go on down in your car and get on your cell phone. And, was, and I'd go into the parking lot of the embassy and that's where I'd be working in, in my car because I'm not allowed to have a cell phone. Now, school, you wanted me to talk. School was phenomenal. I went to Harvard and I equate going there as to the equivalent of going to Harvard, the professors, that taught us were outstanding. The curriculum was out of this world, but they were using physical plant technology like we were back in the 70s. They had nothing new. You know those, these kind of projectors where you took that like flippy uh, uh, clear paper and you put it down there and it would show up? Right. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Slides, uh, the old kind of slides, you know where you click along. So that's where the State Department, somebody has to go there and has to reinvent the State Department from an organizational standpoint. Nothing wrong with the people. They're fantastic people. One, one last question, sir. Just to get back to the email. Thank you so very much. Um, do you have any knowledge of what your successor is doing and whether he is using the soft power that you use uh, to create? Yeah, I, know. I have a lot, of, a lot of information on that. We haven't had an ambassador in the UAE since the day I left, okay? And in fact, for the 60 months from this month going backwards, we've only had an ambassador actually in country for 16 months. We have been missing an ambassador for 44 months in the UAE. And this is typical of all the regions around the Middle East. And it's all because our political system is broken and when I was going through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, upon the direction of Chuck Schumer, said, don't let that guy go. We're going to screw with Trump's agenda. Okay? Now the shoe's on the other foot. What do you think the Republicans are doing? Exactly the same thing. And that's why Martina Strong, who is the next ambassador to the UAE, waited one year to get a hearing, didn't get it, and on January 3rd, her nomination was returned to the president unfulfilled because it didn't cut, cut mustard in the last Congress. She's got renominated sometime in January. But if things go smooth, she won't be there till September or October. It's ridiculous. And I went to my senators and said to them, 
We, this is wrong. And they said, John, don't touch this. You get isolated. Yes, he's called a he's called a charge de faire. Okay, he's not the ambassador. He has no authority. The tra direct translation for charge de faire is caretaker. So just think about leaving your house back home. Yeah, the lights on. You know, it, 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 is the water running? Are we paying the sewage bill? But that charge de faire, that caretaker, of your house, he can't start a new addition. Can't sell the house can't do anything other than just caretake the house, and that's what the charge de fair. And here's a really interesting thing. So last fall, I got invited to go and speak at the World Government Summit, which is held every year in Dubai. Four or 5,000 government officials from all over the world come. I was sort of curious as to why they invited me, but I was honored to go, and I went. The United States government was absent. This was last week. That's where I came from. This was last week, and I asked uh, I asked the charge de faire, what happened? He said, I didn't know about it. And I believe him, because the Emiratis don't pay attention to charge de fares, because they know the charge de faire just pays the water bill and the gas bill and does nothing else. And our political establishment, whether you're Democrat or Republican in this room, we need to fix this. It's a good question.